Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for our next interview in the Women in STEM speaker series. Every Wednesday from now through September 30th, we'll introduce you to some inspiring female role models who are doing incredible work in a variety of STEM fields. This series is supported by the Association of Science and Technology Centers and If Then through a gender equity grant, which supports projects aimed at increasing the representation of women and gender minorities in STEM. And I just wanna give a special thank you to Danielle today for being our sign language interpreter. My name is Kim Amy, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the deputy director of Carnegie Science Center. I am honored and excited to welcome Dr. Rachel Levine, Secretary of Health for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Dr. Levine, thank you so much for making time to join us today. Well, good morning. I'm so pleased to be here. Thank you. So to kick things off, I think it's safe to say that the pandemic is on everyone's minds these days. And I thought I'd start our conversation there. Um, your leadership has been widely praised. Your ability to break down complicated facts and take scary things and explain them in a way that's easier to understand and with reassurance and hope. Um, you've become a household name across our Commonwealth in these last few months. Um, and a lot of us feel like we already know you. But what I don't think a lot of us know is what the Secretary of Health does every single day. So I was wondering if you'd be willing to share a little bit about your schedule. What's on your calendar? What do you do day to day? Um, sure, my days are, are really quite busy. Um, I have always been uh, an early riser, um, so I am up by five, um, and I am on email by 5.30. Um, I uh, am much better at cleaning up email at 5.30 in the morning than I would be at eight o'clock at night, so that's how I start my day. Uh, then um, I get to uh, work. We're all working, actually, um, at the Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency, uh, so none of us are in our regular offices. Uh, some people are working remotely from home, uh, but most of um, uh, uh, my executive, myself and our executive staff at the Pennsylvania Department of Health are here at the Pima building in Harrisburg. Uh, so I'm here by 7 uh, and continuing to answer email and start phone calls at 7.30. We start our formal meetings at 8. Um, and then I am booked solid um, through probably about 6. I go home, I eat dinner, uh, clean up email, try to rest for a couple minutes, and I go to bed. So I go to bed relentlessly early. Uh, so I'm in bed by nine and, you know, headed to sleep pretty quickly to pop up again at five. So that's, that's pretty much my day. I mean, we, we have many meetings internally within the Pennsylvania Department of Health. We also collaborate very closely with our other sister agencies. Um, the Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency, uh, the Department of Human Services, et cetera. Uh, I have um, usually a daily meeting with the governor's office um, and frequently speaking to, to, to the governor. Um, and then many, many stakeholder phone calls. Um, you know, for example, this week we had many phone calls with, uh, about schools, with school superintendents and other stakeholders about schools. And that kind of varies from day to day. Uh, spending a lot of time looking at data uh, about the uh, about the global pandemic and its impact on Pennsylvania in terms of number of new cases and where they are and and um, trying to work out the best way to respond. So, I think it's you know easy for us to imagine that most of your days consumed by the pandemic um, these days, but there are other issues of public public health that I'm sure that you all have to focus on that go on in spite of the pandemic. And I was wondering what those areas of focus are for your department and your team. What policy are you making and what are the priority issues besides sure. the pandemic? <laughs> so um, before uh, the global pandemic of COVID-19, uh, we did have some specific priority issues that we were working on this year. And I can relate some of the ones we worked on uh, last year, which of course continue. Um, so the opioid crisis has not gone away. Uh, and the opioid crisis has been always been one of the priorities uh, for the Pennsylvania Department of Health in collaboration with many state agencies. We actually do have and continue to have an opioid command center um, uh, that meets weekly here at Pima. Now, of course, many of those meetings are now uh, virtual. Uh, and that involves many different state agencies, uh, Pennsylvania Department of Health, 
uh, Department of Human Services, Department of Drug and Alcohol programs, but other agencies, of course, law enforcement, Pennsylvania State Police, uh, corrections, uh, crime and delinquency agencies. So many different stakeholders looking at the opioid crisis from many different perspectives. Um, the opioid crisis continues. Uh, we are continuing all of our, our efforts in terms of rescue, uh, prevention, rescue, and treatment. Uh, we continue to put out prescribing guidelines um, in terms of prevention. Um, and, and messages uh, for prevention of, of substance use in general. We continue to push out the life-saving medicine naloxone or Narcan. Uh, I still continue to have a standing order prescription for anyone in the state to get naloxone, but we also provide completely free all of the naloxone to um, all the emergency management agencies and the, and the, uh, the police in Pennsylvania, et cetera, to, for rescue. Um, we're working on mail order naloxone. That's not available yet, but we're working to get that established. Um, and then expanding treatment, particularly with access to uh, medication assisted treatment, and then working with the Department of Drug and Alcohol programs for those patients to continue in recovery. All of that work continues. Environmental health uh, is, is a priority of the Pennsylvania Department of Health. There have been a number of different environmental challenges. And in this case, we work closely with the Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, one are what are called PFAS or PFOA compounds, uh, perifluorocarbon compounds uh, that have been in um, firefighting foam. Uh, there's been uh, con concerns, particularly in the southeast of Pennsylvania, um, about uh, the Horsham area and Westminster area, about uh, previous military bases and the firefighting foam they used on those bases um, in their trainings. Uh, that went into the aquifer and the water system and the compounds, it's a national issue. Uh, the other is uh, we are establishing a, um, a, a study uh, uh, with an academic um, partner in the Southwest uh, to study any potential health effects of fracking um, on individuals and their health. And so environmental health is a priority. Um, violence is a priority. Uh, violence is a public health issue. Um, looking at many, all different types of violence. So that includes gun violence, that includes domestic violence, that uh, includes sexual violence, it includes, um, uh, you know, violence against the self and suicide. So many different aspects of violence, uh, which have been pri a priority. Uh, we're continuing to work on other issues, maternal child health uh, immunizations. I'm a pediatrician in my initial training. So the childhood immunizations is a priority. Uh, maternal mortality. Uh, Pennsylvania, as the United States, has an increasing rate of maternal mortality, which is a death within one year um, after delivering a baby. Uh, we're the only developed country in the world that has increasing maternal mortality rates. So we have a maternal mortality review committee to look at every single maternal death um, in Pennsylvania with a group of other experts. So many different public health priorities, which all continue uh, while we are still staying focused on, on COVID-19. I think it's easy for us to forget that those things are going on sometimes when we hear in the news um, and all the reports about COVID and everyone's so focused on it. And it's also reassuring to be reminded that you're still working on it, still thinking about those things. Thank you. Um, on a related note, we were wondering if you might share some of the organizations that you're involved with or that you lead, some of the initiatives that you lead um, apart from or with your role as secretary, how it's important to your role, but also important to you personally. Sure. Um, so uh, this year, um, I am the president of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. So uh, this is the national organization with all of the other secretaries or commissioners of health of all the states in the country and also the territories in the country. So there are 57 of us. Um, that's an organization I belong to as long as I've been secretary, so over three years now. And I, I'm extremely uh, proud and, and privileged to be secretary, uh, I'm president of that, uh, of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. So um, uh, we have uh, regular meetings several, several times a week uh, where all the state health officials get together or we have regional phone calls. You know, our region includes uh, Maryland and Delaware and Virginia, West Virginia and the District of Columbia uh, to talk regionally and then nationally about all public health issues. But of course, many of most of the conversations right now are focused on on COVID-19. Um, I was hoping usually the president gets to travel um, and to, to visit many of the states and to visit with many of the state health officials. We have like uh, one big annual meeting a year in Washington and then other smaller meetings uh, and other regional meetings. 
and all of that is virtual right now. Um, so I, I will not get to travel to uh, the Pacific Islands to meet with some of the, uh, the some of the territorial health officials, as has been done before. Or go to California or Alaska or, or uh, Texas or Louisiana. So I'll be staying right here, but we'll be visiting all those state health officials virtually um, and talking with them about the challenges they're facing. You know, I have to say that this is, you know, when I talk with previous state health officials and other representatives from ASTO, this is probably uh, the most challenge that state health officials have been since 1918, when there was much less structure to, the, to those positions um, and you know, the 1918 uh, influenza pandemic. Um, uh, and we are, uh, you know, because of the way the federal government has structured things, we are very much in the crosshairs uh, in the states, um, which has led to, you know, a fair amount of, um, of uh, uh, fame and notoriety, which is not typical of state health officials. You know, I'm not sure many people would know uh, otherwise who their state health officials are, but not only in Pennsylvania, but in many, many other states, if not most other states, state health officials, because they're doing so much media uh, and they're out in, 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 pub, in, in out front with their governors uh, working on things, um, have been in the, in the, in the, uh, in the spotlight and have also taken uh, a fair amount of uh, significant pressure. Um, and, and pushback, according to many of, of the decisions that we've made, especially in regards to mitigation and trying to prevent the spread. So it's a very challenging time for state health officials, and we're trying to work with, with all of us to stay strong and resilient. Great segue to my next question, um, which is exactly about that, being in the spotlight, being thrust into the spotlight, and um, you've been described in your own words, but also by others, as maintaining a laser focus on this pandemic. Um, but you're in that spotlight, um, and you get up and you do it day after day after day. And I was wondering if you could talk about where you find that motivation and that strength to, you know, you're taking us and carrying us all on your back and taking care of us through this thing. How do you find the strength to do that? Well, I, I mean, I do consider myself a, a, a strong and resilient person. And of course, uh, you know, great, great gratitude to my parents and, and my family. Um, but I also think my training as a clinician. So, you know, I, before five, six years ago, when I um, uh, became first physician general um, and then secretary of health in Pennsylvania, now I was in academic medicine at the Penn State College of Medicine. Medical Center. Um, my field was pediatrics and then a subspecialty in what is, but I've been in clinical medicine for decades. And, and I think that my training uh, in medical school and then my training in my residency, and then also my work clinically prepared me very well uh, for the stress and the pressures of where we are. So, you know, um, I think that that's, uh, that in medicine, you have to learn to compartmentalize. Uh, you have to learn to stay focused on the patient in front of you uh, and what the what the issues are. You know, in my experience, could be a young uh, you know a young uh, young woman, fourteen years old, with anorexia nervosa with her parents. Um, in previous times, it could be you know a very sick child in the pediatric intensive care unit or the emergency department. When I was doing more of that work, and so you have to compartmentalize. Um, your feelings, you have to compartmentalize what happened two hours ago, uh, and then no matter how tired or hungry you are, you have to place focus on the patient in front of you. And so I learned very well how to do that, and that training has served me very well now. Do you advice, have advice for those of us out here who are facing um, our own pressure or stress or um, self-care? How, how do you how do you take care of yourself? How should we take care of ourselves in these times that can be isolating and stressful um, and just so different than we're used to? Sure. So I've spoken about that a lot, uh, especially in my previous field, um, especially talking to, to, to young people, but it's, you know, it's very applicable to adults as well. And the metaphor I use is the eye of the hurricane, okay? Um, and so the eye of the hurricane, the hurricane is all of the stress that we feel in our lives. Um, so in this case, we're talking about work stress. And for me, you know, trying to protect the public health of Pennsylvania in the midst of the biggest global pandemic since 1918. So that's, that's all. Um, and, uh, but everybody has work stress or, or school stress or other types of stress. And then, you know, uh, we all have personal lives. So it might, it might be family stress. There could be family illnesses or family disagreements and things like that. And then your peers and 
and, and your friends. And, you know, we, we all have that stress swirling around us. And so the idea is to stay, to stay in the eye of the hurricane as much as possible, because in the eye of the hurricane, it's actually pretty calm. Um, and there's, you know, gentle winds and, and, and you can see everything that's happening around you, but you can stay calm and centered. And so I think that in the midst of the storm, uh, and right now the storm is COVID-19 and this novel coronavirus, to just try to stay calm and centered. Everybody has different ways to accomplish that. Um, uh, uh, um, I, I have to tell you, I don't practice it as much right now uh, because of time constraints, but, uh, but meditation has uh, been something that I practiced for many years and has served, has served me well, even though I might not practice it very much now. Um, but uh, for some, so some it might be meditation. For others, it might be yoga or tai chi or meditation through movements and things like that. For others, it could be their faith. It could be um, exercise and, 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 you know, a certain sport or a certain activity. So that could be running or bicycling or tennis or whatever. Um, it could be music. It could be art. Uh, it, it could be anything. It could be reading. Um, it's anything that centers you and allows you to, to cope um, and compartmentalize those stressful feelings and stay balanced. And so that's the metaphor I would use that I try to use. I mean, no one's perfect. And not, we don't do that all successfully, and we all feel stressed. But, um, but if you, if you, it's good to find that center and that balance, but otherwise you can be overwhelmed with stress. And if you're overwhelmed with stress, then you cannot actually successfully deal with the, the, the issues and problems and decisions that you have to make that are right in front of you. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's a really powerful metaphor that's going to stick with me for some time. Um, my last directly related COVID-19 question has to do with how you see the role of the Secretary of Health and, and any future role you may have in public health. How do you see this pandemic changing things in the future? How do you see it changing priority areas or not? What do you think post-COVID looks like for your, for your line of work? Um, well, I think COVID-19 has changed everything. Um, so again, this is the biggest global pandemic that the world has seen since 1918. I mean, there have seen other global pandemics, but nothing of this scope and proportions. Um, this is a novel, which means new coronavirus. That's a specific type of virus, and it's called corona because how it looks under an electron microscope. Uh, but no one has seen that before. No one has immunity to, to this virus. Um, and, you know, it quickly spread globally. There are a number of characteristics that, that allow it to do that. It's very contagious. Um, it, it is spread from a respiratory droplet. So Ebola, you know, is very not well suited for a global pandemic. I mean, first of all, it's not contagious across the room. You have to have contact with body fluids. And then people get so sick. I mean, Ebola, Ebola has a death rate of sometimes 40 or 50 percent, is that it kind of it, it kind of dies out, literally and figuratively. Uh, this does not do that. Um, so probably around 1 percent of people die. Um, some people question, could it be two, one to two percent, uh, but it's not 50 percent. And so um, it spreads rapidly. Um, most people live so that they're still contagious. Uh, it's also spread by people who have no or little symptoms. Uh, and so uh, it is perfectly um, uh, situated in order to develop this type of, of, of global pandemic. Um, I, I think it has certainly put a spotlight on public health, both um, in, in, in lo locally, in states, nationally and internationally. I think that's good and bad, um, uh, but it certainly has put a spotlight in terms of the importance of public health. Um, I think that we'll be dealing with the novel coronavirus for the next probably two years. You know, hopefully there's going to be a vaccine. Um, you know, if it's, if it's in 2020, that's a miracle, most likely in 2021. Uh, but it, it, it doesn't just get distributed by itself. We're going to have to work to distribute the vaccine. Uh, we'll have to see is if there are enough vaccine and the production rate and the distribution of that vaccine and the distribution not only in Pennsylvania, but nationally and internationally of that vaccine. And so we're going to be hearing about and dealing with it for, for, for several years to come. Um, I think that, um, that it is going to change people's perspectives about public health, hopefully for the better, and it will highlight the importance of public health. Public health has been dramatically underfunded. So if you compare the, the, the budgets of the CDC, which is the biggest public health authority, 
in the government compared to the NIH, National Institute of Health, which does medical research, it's not even close. And if you compare the amount of money spent on, on medicine and hospitals and things like that, you know, I think that public health is, is highlighted this. And so we're going to need more funding and more concentration on public health locally, nationally, and internationally. Hopefully a concentration on, on how we're all connected. I mean, one thing that, that COVID-19 has taught us is that in this world of ours, globally, we are all interconnected. Uh, you know, a, a, an infection in, in China or in Africa or in, 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 in South America influences the world and in the United States, or it could be an, a, an infection in the United States would influence them. I mean, we're all interconnected in this global environment that we have. Um, and so we have to pay attention to, um, uh, to, to international health issues, which is why I feel a, a, any type of defunding of the WHO for all its strengths and weaknesses is misplaced. I mean, we can improve the WHO, the World Health Organization, just like we can improve the CDC and Pennsylvania Department of Health. So we all can, can, uh, can stand in, in better funding and improvement, but to defund it doesn't make any sense to me at all because this highlights how critical it is. If it was slow in the uptake, we need to make it better, not defund it. Because there's no one else that's going to be looking at that those issues globally. So those are some of the changes I think will happen in the public health arena. Thank you. I'm gonna switch gears now and ask you about your background. If you could share a little bit about your education and sure. your career path. You talked about your training in pediatric medicine, but if you could just uh, expand sure. on that a little more. Sure, so I became interested in, in medicine and, and, and healthcare in high school. Um, I went to Harvard College, um, and because I'm from Massachusetts and Harvard down the street, um, and it's a pretty good school. So I went to Harvard College um, and majored in biology uh, with an idea of, be, of going to medical school. Um, I did a lot of um, actually research in my high school and college years at the Boston University School of Medicine uh, and did surgical, worked in a surgical research lab, which taught me two things. Uh, one is that I really, really love medicine but that probably working in a research lab was not my thing. I wanted to work with people. Um, and, um, you know, at that time I was doing other types of research, which, you know, which helped me tremendously. And I still remember very well on the progresses that we made, but that was not what I wanted to do. So in my career, I did a lot of clinical research, but not bench research. Others are very different. So I'm, I have a lot of, I, you know, I had seven years of experience in bench research. This just wasn't my thing. Um, I um, and then went to medical school at Tulane um, and in New Orleans um, and uh, got a tremendous amount of clinical experience in Tulane. Um, uh, it, uh, I, I, there are things that I, that I learned at, in medical school that, that have helped me now in terms of the virology I learned and, and, and things like that, that it's like, where do I know that? Oh, that was probably medical school. Well, um, you know, I, I am um, relentlessly old. Um, I am 63 years old. And so I went to medical school uh, from 1979 to 1983. And so I remember things that I was taught in 1980 that's like, that's where, how I know this. I don't know. Um, and then I did my, I went to New York City and did my training in pediatrics and adolescent medicine uh, at Mount Sinai in New York City. Uh, so I did three years of pediatrics. I was chief resident for a year. And then I was, um, then I did a fellowship in adolescent medicine, that subspecialty. Um, you know, in 1986, when I was chief resident at Mount Sinai, uh, the chief resident had an enormous amount of responsibility and authority. In fact, I often say that it's only now, as Secretary of Health of Pennsylvania, that I have as much authority and responsibility as I had when I was chief resident at Mount Sinai Hospital. Because at that time, the chief resident ran the clinical operation of the Children's Hospital. Now it's very, very different, but that was 1986. Um, so we didn't run the money, or the, you know, the, but then in terms of which patient went where and admissions, that was all the chief resident, uh, which was, uh, and um, learned a lot, uh, obviously. Uh, I then stayed at Mount Sinai in academic medicine, but also uh, was part-time in a private practice. So I learned how, you know, how bread and butter pediatrics was done in a practice. Um, and then in 1993, uh, I made the biggest transition I, I, in my life, which I went from Mount Sinai in 80th and 1st in New York City, and I moved to central Pennsylvania in the greater Harrisburg area. Now, I've had a lot of transitions in my life, we should talk about later, uh, but I still think that this is the biggest transition I made was going from Manhattan to central Pennsylvania. 
Um, um, I was at the Penn State College of Medicine, but based in a, in a community hospital in Harrisburg where I taught the residents and, and the medical students and did pediatrics. And then I moved to the main campus in Hershey in 1996, where I remained for essentially 19, 20 years um, in pediatrics and adolescent medicine, uh, doing clinical medicine, uh, doing clinical research on adolescent medicine and eating disorders, uh, a lot of teaching of medical students and residents, a lot of uh, public speaking in general, uh, to, with other types of teaching to, you know, um, uh, conferences and grand rounds and things like that. Um, and then um, administration. Uh, and then I got a fateful phone call from Governor Wolf um, uh, and uh, it became the jumped complete change of field to the physician general of Pennsylvania in, in 2014. And then in 2000, uh, just three, more than three years ago, became the secretary of health. So that's it in a nutshell. So at our science center, at Carnegie Science Center, our mission is to delight, educate, and inspire people of all ages in um, science and technology. And I'm wondering if there's a moment you remember or an experience you had as a child or growing up um, that you had a similar moment, like a aha moment or a moment of excitement that sparked your love of science? Sure. Um, so several. Um, so one was uh, in 10th grade um, when I took my first biology course. So I'd had science before in middle school and then in ninth grade, but it wasn't the same. But I took biology and I absolutely loved biology. Um, I, I, I really became fascinated with that. Um, I was stronger in biology than I was in, in, um, in chemistry and physics. Um, so, and so biology was my thing. Uh, and then I was able to take sort of an advanced biology class and became more interested in it. Uh, and then I worked at the Step Surgical Research Lab at Boston University. I started working there the summer before 11th grade. And I worked there all through high school and college in the summer. Uh, and then I did actually my senior thesis at Harvard at Boston University, which took, I don't know, 55 signatures of people to, to get approval from. No one had ever done that before. Um, but I stayed at the surgical research lab uh, doing that. And I really loved the science aspect, but, but really wanted more, um, uh, not to be a PhD, but to go more, become an MD um, and made that decision. Um, and then I applied to, to, to medical school. So I would say my, my biology class and then my work at the research laboratory um, when I was at Boston University. But then in medical school, I loved pediatrics. So when we start to do clinical medicine, you know, you really do many different things. I mean, in your, in your third year, you start, you can do peds, you do obstetrics and gynecology, you do surgery, you do medicine, you have some electives, you do psychiatry. Uh, each school is a little bit different in terms of what's required and what's not required. And to me, where, where I found my passion was in treating children um, and so I decided that in, in medical school, my third year, that I wanted to go into pediatrics, that first clinical year. And then I, in my fourth year, I was exposed to this new field of adolescent medicine. There was a professor there who was actually a clinician, primarily a clinician, um, who was seeing teenagers. And I thought that was just cool. Uh, the, and so my goal was to go to a residency program that did um, pediatrics, but had a strong adolescent medicine program and to do a fellowship and then going to adolescent medicine. And that's exactly what I did. Could you talk about the people who have inspired you or mentored you along the way? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's really, really important to have mentors throughout your career, um, especially as a student, but, but not only as a student, because I've had mentors in my, in my clinical career. Uh, and I think that it's important for several reasons. One is that I think that mentors really help you during that time. Um, I think that it's important to learn from mentors what you think they do well and learn from that and to, to learn what you think they actually don't do well, what their limitations are. And I have learned sometimes as much from their limitations as I have from what they did well. Um, and then you need to learn to leave your mentor uh, because as you progress through, uh, and I've had a number of mentors who, who helped me leave. And I've had a number of mentors who said, how could you possibly leave? And it's like, well, because this is the next step for me and I'm going to go to Penn State Hershey and 
you know, and they were, oh, I'm going to leave New York and go to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And why are you doing that? So, and they were kind of upset at me for leaving. So I think it's actually a role of a mentor to be able to, to teach uh, um, your mentee how to leave when it's necessary and not make him feel guilty to do that because that's not your role. Your role is to, is to help them leave when it's time for them to leave. Um, so one would be my biology teacher um, who I've saw several times afterwards, he's since passed, but, um, but my biology teacher. Um, the, several of the people at the lab uh, that, that, um, that I, I, I felt were really excellent scientists and taught me how to think about science. Um, uh, several of pediatricians at, um, at uh, Tulane uh, that I thought were great mentors. Um, you know, a pediatric infectious disease doctor that I was with for a month or two. Uh, the chair of the department I thought really helped me, the head of the genetics uh, department at Tulane, and then that adolescent medicine person. So several mentors in, um, in college, I mean, in medical school. Um, I had a number of mentors during my training program, both in peds and then in adolescent medicine. Uh, and then the person that, whose practice I was in, um, uh, who recently has since passed, and I, I thought he did a great job, but I did learn some things about leadership that I thought I would do something different. Then the person I was at at that community hospital, and then people at um, at uh, at um, at Penn State Hershey, uh, and then I left Penn State Hershey and then went into state government, which just blew everybody's mind. So uh, you know, many I you know there might be a you know a ten or twelve mentors all through my career. So when we we talk about STEM education a lot at, here at the Science Center, and and what makes up that that word STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, and you take that literally, and those are fields of study, but we like to talk about how STEM education is bigger than that, right? It's a way of thinking. It's a way of, of observing the world around you and, and iterating and learning. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk about how STEM education prepared you, not just for your career in medicine, but for this moment that you're in right yeah. now, this transition to government work, to public yeah. service, and to being this, you know, a public servant in the spotlight and needing to communicate with all of us. Absolutely. So, you know, my high school education, I thought, prepared me extremely well for, for college. Um, um, my, my education in, in, in science STEM classes in, in, in college uh, prepared me very well in terms of that analytical thinking, in terms of that objective thinking about how to use numbers, um, which I use a lot now, which, you know, if you ask me then, it's like, why am I doing this? But, but there are reasons why you do this. There are reasons why you take organic chemistry, even though, you know, and then sometimes you use organic chemistry. So it's so interesting. Um, uh, the medical school training, I mean, there's stuff that I learned in medical school that, I, you know, about infectious diseases or things that, that you know, I, I, it's like, where did I learn that? Oh, again, that was medical school. That was my residency program. In, in, in medical school and residency, a lot of times it comes back to specific patients I saw. I remember a patient with meningitis. I remember a patient with influenza or with encephalitis or, or things like that. So, and, and so, and also, but also in medical school and residency program, how to think, how to, how to, how that analytical approach. So I'll give you an example. And this is where I didn't think that he handled it well, but I still learned from it, is that so I was in my residency program um, and where we were given a tremendous amount of responsibility. So I was a second year resident, still pretty young, and I was on call in the neonatal intensive care unit that night. And we had a very challenging night in the neonatal intensive care unit, lots of premature babies that were born that I had to stabilize. Uh, and then one of the patients that was on the unit got sick and, and that baby had to be, uh, had specific treatments that had to be done, uh, had to be intubated and put back on a ventilator. And it was a real downturn for this baby. And I accomplished all of that. So I wake up in the morning, I got like at least 20 minutes sleep and uh, the attending comes in and he screams at me. Now, personally, as a, as, a, as a teacher, a mentor and a leader, I don't scream at anybody, you know? I mean, if I'm stern, you know that I'm upset about something. I mean, if I'm like, hmm, frown. Uh, so I don't think it's worth screaming at any time. But, uh, but he screamed at me, so I don't think that was very helpful, and it made me a little oppositional. But, but what he was trying to teach me, and he could have done it better, but he did teach me, is you can't just respond. You have to take it one step further. Why 
did that baby's clinical condition change? And then it turned out that the baby had an infection and then had to have specific treatments. But now that, but that night I responded appropriately, but I didn't take the next analytical step. And so I learned that, and I remembered that my entire, my entire career, that don't just respond to what's in front of you. I do that now uh, I've, I mean, in terms of COVID-19. Why is that happening? Why do we have an increase of cases in that county? It's not enough just to respond to it. You have to do what we call now a deep dive, all the, the lingo, a deep dive into that county to find out where is that outbreak? Why is that outbreak happening? And then respond to that. And so um, I learned that, you know, at 27 in, in Mount Sinai in, in, in New York, in, in New York City. Um, and then, um, and, and then in my continued learning in my clinical work uh, and my research, uh, clinical research at Mount Sinai, my teaching, et cetera. And I put, you know, at this job, I use everything I ever learned ever in this job. So what, maybe it was a history class about the, you know, in, in high school about the global pandemic. And it's like, well, how do I know that? Oh, yeah, we learned about that in 10th grade. Uh, I learned, you know, something I learned in college, something I learned, you know, just reading. I, I use everything I've ever learned and ever done in this job to the full extent. And so, you know, every experience you have, whether it, it was a positive experience or a negative experience, teaches you something. And so you want to learn those lessons. So these are historic times for our country, and this is an election year. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit, uh, not just about the intersection of, of science and public policy, but also why is STEM education not just important for a professional like you in public health, but for everyone? Why must STEM education be accessible to everyone? Well, I think one of the challenges that, that we're facing nationally is a disrespect of, and a disregard of science. And I, I, I think that, that science doesn't get, is not getting the respect that it deserves. And I don't think that's just during the global pandemic. I think that that's science before. So we could talk about the science involved with climate change and environmental issues. And there are many different issues where, you know, there are scientific principles and great scientists who, who, who have done iterative work, you know, prove, you know proving something or, or demonstrating something, and that that is being um, less regarded for um, for uh, political and uh, political reasons and other reasons. And so I think that that it is really important for everyone to have an adequate STEM background to to be intelligent um, citizens of of the United States uh, to be able to 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 look critically at what news article says what news articles say, um, and to say, does that make sense from a scientific perspective or is that doesn't make sense? And so I think that, um, that that's really important, not just if you're going to go into a STEM field, but I think it's really important for everyone to have that, that analytical scientific background and to learn to respect the scientific method, the scientific process, and to look critically at at, at, at um, the news that we got bombarded with, both the traditional news, whether you, you know, it's on television or online uh, that you're reading or watching, uh, but then of, of course, in terms of social media, where many things get distorted for many different reasons. Dr. Levine, I have a two-part question. One is how important is representation in STEM? And the second part is, what advice would you give to someone who is underrepresented in a STEM field if that person's interested in going into a STEM field? Mm -hmm. Well, so I am a, 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 the biggest believer um, and the biggest supporter of diversity that you will find. I think diversity in all of its faces, in all of the myriad tapestry of this world is just absolutely critical. So I'm going to use some examples, but then there's others that I might, and so don't, don't, this is, this is an ever, ever ending list, but diverse, racial diversity, ethnic diversity, geographic diversity, age diversity, um, uh, background diversity, um, uh, national origin diversity, um, religious diversity, um, uh, um, uh, uh, diversity in terms of sexual orientation and gender identity or LGBTQ diversity, 
I'm, pro I'm missing some. So I'm just, just trying to brainstorm. I think all of that is critically important in any organization and in any field. So whether that is the Pennsylvania Department of Health or state government, whether that's in the federal government, whether it's in local governments, whether it's in a business, whether it's in a school, whether it's in a university, whether it's in a hospital, any organization or, or field such as the law and government or, or STEM, any, any group that you're going to think of, I think it's so important to have as much diversity as, as possible. I think that diversity is always a strength. It can lead to really interesting discussions and that's fine too. But it can it, 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 it brings different points of view to an issue. Um, uh, again, no matter where it is, I think that if um, if you're in a group which does not have adequate representation in anything that I talked about, it is important to do several things. I think it's really helpful to have a mentor uh, to to help you if at all possible. Um, I think that you're going to need to be um, uh, to, to be patient. And you're going to need to learn to be persistent uh, and do not give up. Um, what some people have called me at times is not just persistent, but relentless. And I take that as a compliment. So if, I mean, if I firmly believe in something, I will advocate for it and advocate for it. I've had to learn patience as I've gotten older. Um, things don't just happen. But if I really feel strongly enough, I will continue and I will continue. And almost always I will be successful. Um, and so I think that that persistence is, is so important. Do not give up on what is important to you. Do not give up on, on your dreams. Uh, we all have setbacks. We all have setbacks. That is part of life. And the idea is to learn from those setbacks and then start again. Um, we need, you know, you need to be in the eye of that hurricane. So, you know, so take a day. And, and do whatever you do. So whatever, whether, you know, whether it's music, art, meditation, yoga, your, your faith and spirituality, whatever exercise, whatever it is, you just take your time and then you start again and never give up. My final question for you today, as I was preparing for this interview, um, I kept thinking to myself, how is, Dr. Levine making time. How is she going to make this carve out this little piece of today um, for us, knowing now, especially what your schedule looks like, how early you're up, how late you stay up, all the emails and the meetings and everything that you're taking, you're still here today. And, and my question is, why did you make time for this conversation? Sure. So, you know, what, from one perspective, of course, I'm a physician, and now a public health official. But from one perspective, what I have been all my life is a teacher. Um, so, I mean, I have, so you can think of that in terms of my being a, a professor at Mount Sinai and then at the Penn State College of Medicine. And I'm still a professor of pediatrics and psychiatry at the Penn State College of Medicine. And in that perspective, I have taught, I have taught undergrads at times. I've taught, mo I've taught mostly medical students and residents and then younger physicians, and then mentor, and then giving lectures, and things like that. Uh, but the other is my clinical work. So, you know, when you're seeing a family with a baby, then you, as a pediatrician, you are teaching them often how to care for their child. And when I am seeing a teenager, I am trying to teach them about, um, about their body, and about how to, to take care of themselves. So if they have an illness, how to how to recover from that. So if they have anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa, or if it's more primary care, or if they have substance abuse or something like that, you know, it, it, it's really more of a teacher role, um, uh, trying to do what is called motivational interviewing. How do I motivate this young person to eventually recover from their condition? It's less of a cure. You know, it, it, is, it is a, it, it's a recovery from anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa or from substance use disorder. So the person has to recover, but you have to then is lead them to that and, and to teach them or to teach the parents about how to help their young person. And so but both from, my, from, from, from many different perspectives, what I've done is be a teacher. And so this opportunity is great because I get to be a teacher. And so, you know, and, and what am I doing now? Um, I'm on TV trying to teach people to please wear a mask and wash your hands and uh, you know don't don't gather in large gatherings 
you know, where you can expo get exposed to COVID-19. Um, really, the increase that we're seeing now is in young people. Now, again, I'm 63, so if you're 47, you're still a young person to me. But, um, but um, you know, we're talking young people in their late teens, 20s, 30s, uh, who are not wearing masks, who are congregating in restaurants or bars or, or just congregating in groups. I mean, we've seen outbreaks at birthday parties. We've seen outbreaks at weddings. We've seen outbreaks at, uh, at sports events. And so you really not, you can't do that now, not, not now. I mean, it's not fair and it's, it's, you know, a lot of young people have had a lot of challenging experiences and missed graduations and missed sports and missed classes. And, um, and it's changed everybody's lives, but it's the biggest global pandemic since 1918. It's going to change our lives. So we have to, it's right there, right? It's science. I can't change it. And so uh, it, I agree with you. It's unfair that this is here and is impacting our lives so much, but it is. And so we have, it, it, we have to view it objectively and then we have to take as much as possible data-driven steps to contain the virus and mitigate its response. So what I'm trying to do every day is to teach people. So here I am. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And sure. I, um, do you have any parting words or any other words of wisdom you'd like to share? Sure. Um, so, you know, I, I'm a positive and an optimistic person. Um, I, I, I temper that, especially now that I'm older with realism. Um, but remain a positive, optimistic person. Uh, we are going to get through COVID-19. Uh, Pennsylvania will continue. The um, United States will continue. And the world will continue. What I told the governor in February was, Governor, this is going to be a very significant public health issue, but this is not the end of days. So, I mean, we, we will get past this. And so we all need to, to draw up upon that strength and resilience from ourselves, but then also from our families and our loved ones and our friends and our colleagues. And, and, and to, to really, we need to come together. As I mentioned, it, 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 this has taught us that we are all interconnected in so many different levels. And we, we have to work together and together we will overcome this virus and we will then continue and we'll have learned a lot um, and things will be better than they were before. Dr. Rachel Levine, thank you on behalf of Carnegie Science Center and everyone watching for taking the time today to help teach us, to reassure us and just to be this guiding light through this whole thing. We appreciate you, thank you. Thank you so much, it was a pleasure. Bye-bye now, stay safe. Thank you. And we hope that everyone watching will join us next week for a conversation with Dr. Rosalind Rosario Melendez, Associate Principal Chemist and Project Leader at L'Oreal USA. We'll talk to her next Wednesday, August 5th at 11 a.m. right here on Facebook Live. More details on our full list of speakers in the series can be found on our website, carnegiesciencecenter.org. Thank you all for watching and have a wonderful day.